Um, to give you an idea, I farm right up in this area right there. It's southwest of Odessa, deep well. As there's been a lot of discussion today, you see all those green circles, that's the second half of the Columbia Basin project that's all under deep well irrigation. Uh, up in our area, southwest of Odessa. And there's a few growers here in the room. So I don't know if there's probably, I don't know if there's 10 circles growing, but, but general idea. Um, just a little update, the orange circles you see, those are water service contracts, project water, where, where they'll be able to get some water from the project, but no guarantees. So, and the rest of it is all deep well. There's about 102,000 acres there of deep well irrigation. Okay. Um, this is kind of interesting. I, I, I've spoke at this before, and I don't know, I wouldn't say it's getting redundant, but I was almost going to uh, label my speech uh, um, somewhere along the lines, uh, canola, the burning question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's it going to take for people to grow canola? You know, the price is up now where it's more than equal or better to than growing wheat. Uh, we've heard everything from water management, uh, crop rotations for disease and pests, but um, I'm one of the few guys that do it, but I, if I'm going to raise canola, I want to do it right, and I want to take out all the variables. And one of the variables we learned about today was rhizoctonia with a lot of straw. Uh, my outside ring, when I make my fire break, you're looking at probably 11,000 pounds of straw trying to get pounded back in the ground, which is normally about two trips with a, a mower and about three discings to get it really chopped up and worked in the ground. So, so I'm just, I got to go in there. I'm just going to try and hide out down by the pivot before I get torched. So, okay. Um, this is a little, where I'm looking at, so it looks like it's a little dark, but I'm working with WSU and they're working with the um, Department of Ecology on, on some treatments. They've tried it down at the Lind Experimental Station. Um, it seems like the birds like their seed when it comes up, their little plants, and they've been mowing them off. So Bill talked to me about getting about a half acre out, out on the circle, and that's what we're doing. And the treatment, the four treatments are, there's going to be one where it's been burned and it's been disked. The other one is it was chopped and it was plowed. And then there's just the direct seed into the standing stubble. You can see that on the the middle there, and then there's just a burn direct seed. Um, oh. Going back around right there where the circle's coming around, I'm putting on two and a half inches of water the first lap, and that's after it's been burned. I really disc it really lightly to break that crust up. So I disc maybe about two inches, and that, that lap was at two and a half, then I have two more laps at 1.8 inches, and I think my last lap was at four tenths of an inch. After that, I go and take a soil sample. There's only a couple things that I've learned over the years I look at, and one, number one is over to the right you see boron at 0.28, and I like that boron at 0.50 is what I've learned. And normally we just put a quart of borosol or something on. Um, then phosphate, I'm at 20 parts per million, and everything I've ever learned, it's right there's the phosphate. Um, I'm at 20 parts per million, and they say normally about 17 parts per million is what you need, so I don't add any phosphate. And you come down below, it shows that I have like 78 pounds of in through what's left with everything, but it's still calling for 178 pounds for 3,500 pound canola. Uh, when I started growing canola, it's been going on 15 years now. I dinked around a lot with the soil nitrogen and sulfur ratios, and I finally came to the conclusion after doing different treatments across the field, I'm at a four to one ratio, nitrogen to, to sulfur, and that's where I like to be. So this fall on this field, I put um, 80 pounds of in, 20 pounds of sulfur. Uh, the nitrogen is urea. Uh, next spring, I'll come back in, put 100 pounds of in down with uh, 25 pounds of sulfur. It's all, all putting on with the interrogator. Uh, boron, um, previous years I've normally put it through the water. This year we, we flew it on. So, it, I, I don't know. 
I don't know if I saw any difference or not, but it still made a good crop. Okay. Go ahead. Here, they just got done putting the, the fertilizer on. We're, it doesn't take a real heavy disc. We're discing and packing. I don't disc any more than four inches deep. Um, just disc in with a Schmeiser packer behind. And that basically that's the same disc where I just disc maybe a couple inches to break the crust. Okay. Next slide. Um, John Deere set of 455 drills. Uh, every other opener I have plugged off, so the drill's normally on a seven and a half inch spacing. I go to 15 inch spacing. Uh, a couple other guys, I don't, I don't know if I've talked to Dallas Dyfe, he's, he's, he's in the room. You know, going from that to say 21, 22 inches, going, you know, opening, have one open, block off to, you know, that'd be kind of interesting, but you're getting a pretty big space there, so. Plus, you're getting a lot of seeds per inch when if you're going at four pounds. So, I don't know. You can see where the drill is sitting right there. When I talk about the stubble, uh, that was chopped twice, this three times, and then where the, the marker is, uh, that's where it was burned. So, I just, I did not burn one year. I was the third year I grew canola. I had every disease under the sun out there with all that straw and residue. And I only made 1,400 pounds. And I said, that's enough. I, that was a big enough learning curve there. So, okay. Um, seed cup opener. These few pictures were in, was when Karen Sauer, Sauer, she was out that day when we were seeding. Uh, it's kind of a joke, but how do we set our drills? If you look at the flute there and, and how much it's open, you get your file on your Leatherman. And that's how you set the drills to begin with. It's, it's crude, but it's effective. Uh, on the right hand side of the opener, you can see where it's a little more shiny. If you slide that over, normally that's where I see the wheat at 100 pounds per acre, so that's it's quite a difference from wheat to canola. Okay. This picture was taken, this field was seeded on September 7th. Uh, this field was, or this picture was taken on September 21st. I just got done putting on four tenths of an inch of water. Pretty dry fall. We didn't get any rain until the middle of October. Um, actually, Karen and Mary Beth were out, and you know, I was glad to see Mary Beth out. You know, she's not a behind the desk person. She was out wanting to learn, which is, to me, is great. Uh, as you can see here, every other opener was plugged off, so we're at 15 inch spacings. Uh, the seed went on at about four and three quarter pounds per acre, and it's Amanda. You can see kind of at the bottom of the screen there, all the re residual, and then off after that, that's where the ground's been burned out, or the straw's been burned. Okay. Um, everybody talks about plant size going into the winter. Um, I'm not a big size person. Um, to me, one, you're burning moisture. Two, you're burning fertilizer. And for me, they both cost. To pump the water, I got a power bill, and everybody knows what the price of fertilizer is. So I generally do not like my plants any bigger than a salad bowl. You know, some people might think that's small, but I think that's right. And you know, it's, you can see how far down the tap root is. This was mm, about seven weeks after it was planted. So, and so you can see there's probably about as much biomass down below the ground as there is on top already. Okay. Uh, springtime, as soon as they can get in on it, uh, interrogator putting the dry fertilizer on, urea, sulfur. You can see the, the volunteer weed out there. We'll either go in with a sure two or select after this and kill that. Um, up our way, every irrigator basically pulls one of these in one fashion or another, rotary subsoiler. Um, it's on two and a half inch two and a half foot spacings. Uh, like to put it in all the way, we're going down 18 inches. Helps for water penetration. Um, I guess you want to say it leaves like a little shark tooth in the ground. It doesn't heave the ground to speak of when it comes up and out of it. Over the course of the spring, it, they'll want to sill in a little bit, but what I've noticed, even when it silts in, when you pre-irrigate in the fall, you find one of those marks you'll go down 30 inches and it's wet down to 30 inches versus you go in between one of those sets of subsoilers and you're down, wet down only about 16 inches. So actually it, it does help for 
water infiltration in the fall even. Okay. Um, this is, um, how do I put it, two years ago, first year Jack had a, Brown had Amanda for production and seed. Uh, this, is, this was, I guess, his baby. Um, in the background there, I've worked with the University of Idaho for probably 10 years on test plot work. And that's their test plot. And, you know, you've got to give Jack and Jim a lot of kudos because they're at the forefront of everything, as far as I'm concerned, for breeding in the Pacific Northwest. And they're basically the only breeding program that I know of. And what's nice about this is I can see the Roundup Ready, all the diff different varieties coming in. And if you ever look at one of these seed charts, I'm the Moses Lake column. And I guess I'm going to leave it that. I, I did kind of get into a little row with a gal from Monsanto one time about yield lag, but she didn't want to believe it. So the proof is in the pudding on the results, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Becky talked about bees this morning. That's, uh, that was not a good deal where they set them. It's, it's the, the well road or the pivot road. They came in at probably about 2 o'clock in the morning with a semi-load and just dropped them right there. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. My well is right there. The pivot road is right there. So either every morning or every night, guess who had to go through those bees? <laughs> I, I know one thing. If you, drive by, if you go through, even on a motorbike, a four-wheeler, whatever you have at about five miles an hour, they won't bother you. And that's basically you want to go in early or late at night, or if you've got a problem, you'll just go through it. But it's kind of interesting, you know. Kind of, I kind of wanted to see what the inside of one looked like, so it was right before dark one night. I just went over and lifted the lid up when they were all in there. And it, um, there's, there's a potato field over to the left, and the potatoes had come up when these were sitting there. The, the, that was this year. And, and I told the bee guy, I said, you got five days to, to get those bees out of there because I said they're going to fly an insecticide on those potatoes and I don't want you to have a whole bunch of dead bees. So I guess communication is huge part of the whole deal. And, you, you know, we talked a little bit about this morning. You know, I'm in a potato rotation every four years and canola in between. It's wheat, canola, wheat, and potatoes. One, I had rhizoctonia. That's why I burned number two. Sclerotania is huge for me. And I was taking some huge yield hits until two years ago, and I had to do something. I started off right around 3,000 pounds when I first started growing, and I was getting down to 24, 2,500 pounds. I'd go through draws because I swath. You could see it swathing. You could see the, the white stems out there. So for the last two years, um, I put quadris on at maximum rate at about hmm, somewhere right around 20% bloom, or when I start seeing some petals on the ground. Um, I don't know if it's Jack's variety, Amanda, or the Quadrus, but I can honestly say my yield's gone up 20% of over what it was. I, I was down to that 26, 2700 pound range the last two years. I've, I've averaged 3,500 pounds. Okay, next slide. Swathing. Um, you know, everybody, everybody has their own recipe. I'm going to leave it at that. You know, you swath, you push, you direct cut. We've had the best luck at swathing. Uh, you can see down here in the draw, it's kind of heavy and it goes down and it's not fun. So swath a circle with no problems, you're probably looking at 20 hours. Um, if you've got problems, you're probably looking at 22 to 24 hours. So. And normally we swath at night. You always like to have a little dew. You look, it's pretty, still, it looks pretty green yet, but yet those pods, if it's 90 degrees out, they'll want to shatter. Um, normally we swath it, and in six days we're in harvesting, which is what I like. I, it's just a whole timing deal. I don't have to wait or anything. It's just boom. Do I put spot in them on? No. Okay. Um, this year, I know Dallas is here. He got hit by those high intensity storms that came through this year. Uh, this field, if you look off to the right up here, um, I got, that was like the first day of harvest. I went out the next morning. I thought, well, shoot, maybe I can get a picture of the amount of shatter we got. Um, this field took three wind storms. The last one was 50 miles an hour with driving rain. And I called it, it was almost like a monsoon rain. 
Um, this is facing east. There's a road right there. I had canola coming up over the top of the pickup during that storm out of my field into the neighbor's field. Uh, right here was a turn. I turned to go west uh, from this power pole to that power pole. It was 300 feet. I couldn't see 300 feet. That's how driving the rain was. And the rain was sideways. So all this stuff right here, that white shiny stuff, it's empty pods. Um, I had no idea what it was going to do. It still went 3,466 pounds, which I was pleased. Without the shatter, it probably had been the best crop I had. Um, I know Dallas had it. I had it. Some stuff that was down, and it kind of got bunched together a little bit. couldn't dry out. And we had mold in the pods. The, the actual seed molded, and nobody had ever seen that before. Okay. Uh, harvesting. You know, you talk about buying extra stuff, extra equipment. You know, I guess I could go out and buy a pickup header, but I'm too cheap, so I just use my regular header. <laughs> just put some lifters on it on six inch spacing, 16 inch spacing, and just cut away. Um, you know, talk about speed and stuff this morning. Uh, there I'm probably going 2.4 miles an hour. You're, you're looking at a, a 16 foot roll. The row is actually only five feet, but the, kind of, but the swather's at 16 feet. Uh, you try and take two of those, which I can, you're done down to a mile an hour at, at the most. There's just so much material going over those sieves, you can't separate it. Um, can you go faster? Yeah, I had a grower call me, he said he was going three and a half miles an hour and he couldn't save it. And I go, you might want to try slowing down <laughs> the amount of material. It'll, it'll eat it, the combine will eat it, but you won't save it, you know, and that was, somebody talked this morning about, you know, maybe a different type of sieve setup or whatever in the back, so. Wind speed. Wind speed? I knew that might be asked. So, Combine. combine's at 2388. Let's see, the wind speed. Okay, I got the fan set at 950. Uh, the rotor set at 390. Uh, the top sieve, the front third's closed and the middle and the back is set at 3 8 and the bottom sieve is set at Three sixteenths. It's pretty close to what it calls for in the book, you know, which was amazing. I was all green until five years ago, and now I got a red combine, red tractor. I got a lot of red now. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's John Deere's fault because the dealers kind of pulled out of the area, and there's a red dealer in town, and you, you know, like to keep that business in town. I hate to say it. Um, this is the end of the slideshow. What do I do afterwards? You do not want to bury that seed. You know, you don't want to go in there with a heavy disc. Uh, I just like to go in and undercut it or sweep it, set it for about four inches. It kind of lifts the ground up, sets it down just enough for a little seed soil contact, and just pour the water to it and watch the volunteer come. Because I don't care how well you think you got your combine sealed up, there is a lot of seeds, especially if you think about it, you know, a pound of canola has 100,000 seeds in it, you know. You, how many seeds per acre is out there? You, you look around and you can just see seeds. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Uh, one thing that was never talked about today, and Becky kind of touched on with bees, is the wildlife aspect. Wildlife love canola. There's no getting around it. You talk about pheasants, you talk about deer, deer having their fawns in it. You talk about coyotes and right now where that small canola was in that one picture I showed you, I was up there yesterday, looked at it, I got a herd of 53 deer in it right now. <laughs> Which is, I don't know, there was a neighbor that had over 300 a couple of years ago in his, so. Do they do any damage? Not really, but I don't know if it's good for it. Somebody come up and go on. Actually, he did complain to the game department, they gave him Tindo permits after the facts for next year. So that's about it. Yeah. Excuse me, uh, how many inches of water did you pump on for that truck pipe for how many years? Um, as you can tell in the fall, I put on five or six inches in the fall, then whatever we get during the growing season, which is around seven inches, and then I put on another seven inches this spring. So, so well, maybe 20 inches would be stretching it, but overall irrigation, seven inches this spring. Yeah. Yeah, with Mother Nature, you know, and sometimes that isn't enough. You know, they, you just, 
you know, the water management is huge where, you know, we don't have all the water in the world. So, and it's, it was talked about today on, you know, disease fact, disease. Uh-huh. Well, here, the, the problem with that is, is with my rotation, canola takes water early. I can water it, walkway, fill a profile, and then I water the wheat until about June 12th, and then the potato guy's knocking on the door wanting three quarters of an inch of water every 36 hours. So he's the water hog for basically all summer. And that's, that's why I started growing canola. It's just a water management deal. You know, we grew peas, beans, and everything else underneath the sun. And good, bad, or ugly, that's what I'm stuck with. So that's it.